to this very exciting afternoon um, when we are going to present Pat in honor of Mr. Doctor, as we would call him as he walked through the lobby. Um, Helen, to your wonderful family, thank you for letting us put this plaque on the building. Um, I want to welcome uh, many people. First of all, Rocco Steno, who you're going to get to know. He's the director of Empire State Center for the Book. And I'll tell you a little bit about how we got this plaque. I want to thank Ben Carlos, who is our council member of the 5th District of New York. Um, so we should all get to know him. At least those of us that live in his district. And I also want to welcome Dr. Jacqueline Jaffe, um, who uh, will say a few words as well. Um, again, welcome everyone. Um, and now we have Yes, well, uh, thank you so much. You know, it's uh, very exciting. Uh, the uh, Center for the Book is the uh, New York State affiliate of the National Center for the Book, which is out of the uh, Library of Congress. And uh, we're under the auspices of the New York Library Association. And we uh, have various projects. And uh, one of our projects is how I actually uh, met uh, Mr. Doctorow. Uh, one of our projects is the New York State Writers Hall of Fame, and each year we induct a class of writers, and in 2012, uh, Mr. Doctorow was inducted along with uh, Toni Morrison and Pete Hamill and Joyce Carol Oates, and that's how I actually knew he lived at 333 uh, East uh, 57th Street, and um, when Councilman uh, Kalos um, came to a literary landmark at a Bolshevik's Park for Harry the Spy. Um, he said, this is terrific. And we should be doing more landmarks in the 5th uh, District. And uh, thanks to his support, we are doing two on the same city block. You know, and we just did one at 320 Frost Street for Eric Maria Remark. And, uh, and here we are at uh, 333. And you know, during uh, the time uh, Mr. Dr. O uh, lived here in this building, he wrote many of his uh, famous uh, works, and you'll probably see some of them uh, named on the uh, plaque. But it's not over because uh, in October we uh, uh, collected uh, Dr. O's collected stories uh, is coming out. I believe it's uh, October 25th, and one of the stories is a Wakefield. And that's going to be a film with a Brian Cranston, I guess, this December. So this is an exciting year for the Dr. O family. And um, uh, I, um, I'm, I'm excited that I'm here to, today. And Thank you very much. Yes. Um, I'd like now I'd like to pass the word over to the council. Thank you so much for joining us. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. There's such massive turnout for this, and it's so amazing to be here. I'm here, Council Member Ben Kalos, and I like to read. Uh, I uh, met uh, Rocco and learned about the Empire State Center for the Book uh, when, again, they were doing something for Harriet the Spy, a book many of us have read. How many people here have read that book or read it to a child at some point in our lives? And so uh, we have a challenge in our city. Uh, we are growing, but there's a history, and there's a past, and there's preservation. And as people seek to raise our neighborhoods, raise our buildings, replace them with 900-foot towers, my goal is to actually maintain, preserve, and connect people to their past in a very similar way to the way Yale Doctorow did. Uh, because my hope is, if somebody walks down 57th Street and sees this, and uh, sees the works and the books, and feels a connection between time and space and place that they will take out that book from the library or purchase it or just get it on an ebook on their phone but read it and connect and uh, for my part when I was uh, taking a Judaic studies class at SUNY Albany ragtime was in our coursework and uh, I'll tell people a secret I, I was not born at a time when ragtime was happening. It is not in my recent memory. And uh, it was difficult to connect. But what I could connect to was uh, Harry Houdini. Who hasn't heard of Harry Houdini? 
I could connect to uh, Freud, I was a psychology major, major in Jung, and that I could connect to him through that I was able to really understand more of the story and uh, through that and what he was able to do, which was pure, truly unique, the New York Times, his obituary was talks about all the different things uh, that he did and how he is remembered and how he is unique and one of a kind and it's just a uh, pleasure to be here and to uh, celebrate him. Um, uh, when I was running for office, I may have called many of you. I called all the people I could in the neighborhood and asked for their vote. I, I had the opportunity to uh, speak to E.L. Dr. O uh, on the phone and ask him for his vote. Uh, and unlike a lot of the other luminaries in the neighborhood, he actually took my call. He spent significant time with me on the phone. Uh, I know that he did vote in the primary. Uh, I am hoping that he voted for me. I, I won't know. I hoped that we would one day get a chance to, to break bread and uh, where I could learn more. Uh, but the least I can do is uh, work with uh, Rocco and others to uh, dedicate this building and this literary landmark to him and just uh, thank him and his family for all that you have done and that he has done in shaping our world today. Thank you. that when you start to talk about him, you feel that words are completely inadequate. Because he is a great experimentalist in his writing. He's a great scopist in his writing. He, did, he takes big subjects. He does the consciousness of hundreds of people in his novels. It's very hard, if you're talking about Joyce Carol Oates, you talk about small things. I, I hope you understand what I mean. But Dr. O is a huge writer. He's like the Russians in that sense. He has a big canvas. And it's not just that he has a big canvas in the sense of thousands of characters, although Ragtime has hundreds of characters. It's that he takes each little thread of consciousness and weaves it through the plots of his novels so that even if you're not a great reader of Ragtime, by the time it seems to me you get 100 pages, you can't put it down, or at least I couldn't put it down. Um, we are lucky today, and in a minute I will just go through another issue, but um, the thing I wanted to talk to you about, Doctor, about is how he taught writing at NYU, which is, I, I didn't know him, I'm sure everybody in this room really knew him, I didn't. But as a, as a writing teacher, he used to say to students, and I know because they then would come to my class and tell me, he would say to students, writing is writing. It is not play, it is not a party, it is not joyful, it is writing. You write and write and you write. And sometimes I think about students today that actually the kind of discipline that is involved in that statement was quite, is quite foreign to them. They write quickly, they go to computers and quickly write. But Dr. O always said to them, put that aside. Writing is writing is writing. You explore yourself, you start, you know nothing, you get somewhere, and you've written something, and it's not good enough, and you start again, and you rewrite, and you rewrite. And I always thought that was a blessed thing for somebody in this day and age to say to students. You have to work at writing. It's a discipline, you would say. It's not fun. Um, I want to, before I just talk about his honors, you're lucky to, 
I suppose we're all lucky to have two people who actually went to school with him. We're going to share some anecdotes. So first of all, um, Ed Grossman, would you talk about so would you talk about him being at school? All right, tell, talk about my experience with him. Mainly, I lived in his house, in his apartment. I, I lived up on about 169th, 170th Street. School was on his uh, public school. By the way, he didn't read his book, and I wouldn't have to say a word. But I think it was his first book that he wrote. It was a pleasure for me to read it because it reminded me of my childhood. Talk about his uh, a swimming teacher, I forget his name already, but we would go together to the swimming pool. I ate lunch at his house every day because we, I lived so far away. Uh, unfortunately, he was a lot brighter than I was and was able to go on to uh, a better school than I did in, in high school. I went to David Clinton and he was at the uh, did you say? Science. 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 Okay. Science. So I think we, we split up at that time. The next time I met him, by the way, was at the theater in, in Manhattan uh, just a few years ago. Uh, and, uh, I always said, you know, I really should have continued a friendship. We were very good friends in those days. Uh, aside from that, anyone who told me in the book, as we talked about the schoolyard, where See, I, this, my memory is not that great, but I do remember him telling the stories of where they played softball in the schoolyard. The long shot was to the left side, and then on this side was the short side. Everybody was aiming to the right side because it was easy to hit a home run there. But it was a, you know, it was a great experience in those years of my life. And Especially to read his book. I mean, I've read all of his books, but that one in particular was the beginning of my life. It was a pleasure to read. tarnish any reputations, but we went, that was a character, and it's interesting because I went, oh, please put those away, live in the moment. <laughs> so, so Dr. O, E.L. Dr. O, was in my class in Bronx High School of Science, and we were the two guys, probably we never cut school, we enjoyed the science, and I think what Mrs. Jaffe said, please, is so true about the, the discipline, because we, we had discipline at Bronx Science. And the scientific method, if any scientists see it, they know that one theory is already overlapped and a, and a better theory comes along. You don't give up, you don't stop, you know, you keep going. And uh, that's what we learned. So I was always proud that E.L. Doctor was in my class. I'd always tell people, you know who was in my class? <laughs> E.L. Doctor. And I said, wow. Well, he, was a, he, he spoke from the heart. And all about, you're saying, of weaving all that thing, all that stuff. I always figured that he must have gotten that from the Bronx subway map. <laughs> you know? But he, he did talk about big things because we went to Bronx Science. And uh, it, it, was, it was like a family there. And science and art do go together in some way. Yeah. And uh, so sometimes we take the train and go down to, uh, you know, get off at the Empire. Uh, not the Empire State, the uh, Chrysler Building, that was the best stop. You know, we could stand in the front of the subway train, you must have done that too well, right? And you drive the subway train, 3rd Avenue L. And God bless him, and I'm so happy, and I'm so proud to have met his wife, who knew him a couple of years after he left Bronx High School of Science, right? So nice to meet you all. And of course we were all Ed, Dom, and Pete, you know, so. yeah. and 
I just went. And we had a tough uh, gym teacher. You can probably remember too. <laughs> Blackjack Mike, something like that. Front side still has some gym teacher. Then we could sit around the auditorium. Then, 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 then. I was only Italian kid, but I learned a lot of that. <laughs> it was wonderful. We had a good, good time in science. Mm -hmm. With the discipline. Discipline. Yes. And that's important. You didn't say it was well, I think um, it would be impossible for me to start listing all of the awards and uh, honors that he was given over the years. I mean, just everything that any writer ever got, he got, sometimes he got them twice. But I suppose that the most important, from my point of view, is the, um, the National Humanities Medal. So when he died last year, when that happened, it would be hard to imagine that there would be anything that he didn't have. But I suspect, correct me if I'm wrong, but I suspect a plaque in his honor on the outside of the building would rank there with those achievements, and I think that he would be very happy about that. So thank you. I agree with you, he would have loved the plan. Yes. I, I think he would be totally thrilled by that. Very honored. As we are. Yes. My name is Jenny Doctorow. I'm the eldest of E.L. Doctorow's children. And I'm here today with my family, my mother Helen, my husband Marcos Faye Hornstein, my son Gabriel Coffey, my sister Caroline Dockerow, my brother Richard Dockerow, my nieces Graylin Gatewood, Annabelle Gatewood, and my brother-in-law somewhere is Grover Gatewood. And we represent the most of the nuclear family. So we are very pleased and proud to come out today. So on behalf of the Dockerow family, I would like to thank the Empire State Center for the book and United for the Library for this I would also like to thank the many individuals who worked to bring this plaque to fruition, including City Councilman, Ben Kalos, Rob Mosteno, and uh, Jennifer Garza of Random House, Susan Siegel of the building, and Jacqueline Jaffe for her lovely talk. My father was a native New Yorker born in the Bronx, and he lived in the city and its suburbs nearly his entire life. A sense of place is paramount for a writer, and none more than for my father, who produced vivid portraits of the city in many of his novels. His subjects were not only the New York of his lifetime, his treatment of New York in centuries past brought the city to life for his readers and helped us identify with the triumphs and struggles of New Yorkers who lived and breathed long before our time. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. As a child, my father rode the elevated train from the Bronx into Manhattan to the circus bought penny sweet potatoes from carts on East Burn Avenue, visited the boardwalk of Rockaway Beach with his parents and his older brother. As an adult, he brought his children from our home in New Rochelle to the city, where he would speak with enthusiasm about the landmarks of his childhood and the political and cultural institutions that shaped the city. In his books, he captured the spirit of many eras of our collective history, the country as a whole, but also the specific energy and lore of New York. So it was fitting that in 2000, he and my mother relocated permanently to this building, 333 East 57th Street, where they married their oldest child <laughs> upstairs. <laughs> Sorry, that was impromptu. <laughs> but where my father wrote his final three novels, The March, Homer and Langley, and Andrew's Brain. He was excited to return to the city of his birth. Its unique creative energy was an inspiration for him for the past 15 with this plaque, my father, E.L. Doctorow, officially becomes part of New York history. This recognition from the Literary Landmarks Program means a great deal to those of us in his family and to the many New Yorkers who have been touched by his influence. Thank you.